after I introduce you. All right, all right. Hello and welcome. My name is Mario Batali, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Kate, Slick, and Hank, and we're talking about Italian cooking here, more specifically the beautiful cuisine of Rome. And there's nothing so emblematic of Rome as the beautiful idea of simple, fresh fish, very basically prepared, treated in a simple way, and exuding all of that most important ingredient, that is to say, the freshness. Now, of course, whenever you're buying fish, regardless of what the recipe says and what fish you're supposed to buy, the single most important thing that it is, is it has to be fresh. It has to be a certain firmness. In fact, on scaly fish, you want to have a certain amount of slime going on in it. When you look at it in the eye, you want it to look right back at you as opposed to kind of like this, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> the whole idea behind identifying and understanding what freshness is all about is based on the trust that you'll have for your fishmonger. And as opposed to going to buy your seafood at the grocery store wrapped in plastic sitting in a long rowboat, you want to go somewhere where they have beautiful fish laid out and displayed, maybe on marble, maybe on ice, maybe in a cool kind of a refrigerated unit, and get the most important thing from that guy. That is to say, the fishmonger's advice. What is good? What's going to work with the recipes? Don't just go blindly buy sardines because the recipe says to buy sardines. Because if the sardines are old, no matter what you do with them, it's not going to be good. And that brings us back to that main tenet of great Italian cooking. Slime. That is to say, yes, slime, slime and what they call prima materia. The first material, the most important thing that you can buy and what's really going to set the tone for your entire meal is the best first ingredients. If you buy bad fish, you're never going to make great meals no matter how good of a cook you are. If you buy great fish, and as long as you don't mess with it too much, it's going to be pretty good. Keeping in mind that Italians don't necessarily eat their fish medium rare or rare. They tend to eat it cooked through or marinated through. And speaking of marinating, that's the first dish we're going to do here today. This is something that we have at our restaurant called Lupa. Lupa Osteria Romana. It's here in New York City. And we take these beautiful fresh sardines and marinate them much like they do the alici in the Campania region over by Naples and Amalfi. The first thing you do is you get your fish, You'll have your fish guy either gut it for you or you can gut it yourself. And the way you gut it here, just as I promised here, fish guts for breakfast, Mr. Swidey. Delicious. You just yeah. make Yummy. a slit there and then pull that out. There's no reason to be afraid of it. It's very simple. It's easy to do. Smaller fish, obviously, are going to be easier than bigger you know, fish. You don't have to flick fish guts at us, Mark. I'm not flicking them. They're <laughs> flying up by their own accord. Because some people are born on time, and some people are born late. And the late ones get the fish guts. Right. Now, the easy right. thing to do here is just remove that little part of the scale at the belly. And then, there you have it. From the other side, we do it also from the top. Just drag the knife along the bone. And this also is a good example of how to always use your knife. Whenever you're trying to remove the bone from something, always scrape at the bone, not at the flesh itself. Then take a little bit here along the kind of little rib cage there at the belly. And there you have it. So now those are beautiful anchovy fillets. I mean, sorry, sardine fillets. And what we're going to do is we're going to marinate them. Now the first thing we're going to do is cure them. And the way you cure things is by soaking them in either sugar, salt, or a combination of the two. So what we're going to do is we're just going to dip them quickly. First into sugar, then brush it off, and then second into salt. And we're going to do that with all of these just like so by going quickly. And what that's going to do, what salt does, oops, what salt does is it causes all the liquid to come out of a cell, for example. If you ever did anything in biology, I'm sure you were a biology scholar in high school, weren't you, Swidey? Yeah, well, biology, what, what salt does, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm not surprised. What salt does is cause the liquid to come out of a cell. What the liquid carries in it is anything that's going to spoil. So just like curing prosciutto or bacon or pancetta with salt, it's the same thing with fish. So we're just going to... Do it like so, and then let it sit overnight in a refrigerator. And what's going to happen at that point is they're going to be almost preserved, like preserved lemons, like ham, like anything else. And we're going to toss it in the fridge, and then we'll take a look at these, which are, that has already been done to. And as a matter of fact, when you get them like that, you'll see that what's come out is the liquid from the cells. There's this kind of slimy, oozy liquid like that. What you want to do at that's, this point, yes? That's the part Ed likes. The yeah. slime. Yummy. Well, actually, this, is, this would also be called la colatura. And in fact, it's very popular right now to use in pastas or for your breakfast dishes for you, Mr. Swidey. You'll notice that at this point, rinsing this off, they're also a little bit firmer texturally. They're like almost like a little bit harder. That's to say that they're practically completely preserved at this point. Now, at this point, what we want to do is add some flavoring to them. So we're going to dust them off a little bit, dry them off by taking a little bit of a paper towel. You catching a little anchovy stuff? I mean, getting, sardine stuff there? Getting some action here. Yeah, well, that's good. Now, we just 
pat them dry because we don't want the water. We've just spent time trying to get the water out of there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take some juice. Orange juice, lemon juice, and grapefruit juice. And what nice. that's going to do is introduce kind of a citric sweetness to it. This is also going to help them preserve because they're going to pick up a different flavor from all of this stuff. And the acidity also helps preserve things. We're going to take a little bit of the zest of each of those, lemon, lime, and grapefruit. And then we're just going to lay the fish in there like so. Now you can tell already, this, is, this at this point, aside from being preserved, is now almost starting to feel a little bit like a ceviche, the Latin way of preserving or curing fish raw without ever having to cook them. Now what we're going to do is we're going to allow those to soak overnight in the fridge. And at this point, they're completely ready. And what they'll look like is like this. In fact, it doesn't look that much different from the one right there. And at this point, these are ready to eat already, but they're not going to taste nearly as good as these. So we've got these all going and they're marinating. Now we're going to take a little bit of bulgur, the cracked wheat, and we're going to take some cup and a half of bulgur, two cups of water that's boiling, and just pour it over the top. And it's going to cook by itself. I'm actually, I don't even need to turn this heat on. I'm going to stir it around like that. I'm going to put the top on, and very much like a couscous, we're going to allow it to steam. When we come back, I'll show you how we're going to make a sound out of that, and then do the presentation for this, and then get down and get funky with some of these pesci. Please, nice. stay with Sweet. us. Welcome back. <clears throat> now we have our beautiful bulgur here, just cracked wheat, looking good. It's a very simple accompaniment to these exquisite fish, and it's an interesting idea of taking something kind of bright and acidic and then something almost dirt, soil tasting, earthy. earthy. Excellent. Excellent slick. So what we're going to do is just dress our bulgur here with extra virgin olive oil, lemon juice, and season it just with a touch of salt, so as not to obfuscate its natural terra flavor. Then what we're going to do is just pile a little bit on the plate. And it makes an excellent foil for those beautiful sardines. Now, the sardines themselves are exquisite, but what we're going to do is gild the lily a bit here and make a cute little salad. Now, what we like to do is make a salad almost like a gremolata. We're going to take some chives. We're going to take some parsley, some celery leaves, a little bit of fennel fronds and pick it off just like so and dress that all with just a touch of lemon and extra virgin olive oil and a bit of salt and this dish is going to present itself now when you got stuff like this it's so easy presentation shouldn't be very fussy just a simple little mix like so so we'll toss that like that then we'll take the sardines to the plate I'm not afraid of a little gremolata no you shouldn't be gremolata is your friend yeah. <laughs> So now we're going to do it just like that. We arrange them around without making them look too much like we had 19 little French guys with big hats and a bad attitude going on here <laughs> in the kitchen. And just pile them up. Now the natural abundance is going to work all for itself. Then we'll take the salad like that, toss it with a little zest over the top, mix like so, and then boom, slada boom, we got sarde a la lupa. Bon appetit! <laughs> Go ahead and serve them up, guys. Leave them right there. Leave them right there. Move the plates to the area. You don't want to be moving the sculpture from the loo. I don't there want them go. to get any of it. Now, the next thing we're going to make is something that's really cool and not very seen, and it's actually called gnocchi di segale. It's a rye flour gnocchi, and the way we're going to do it is we're going to take some rye flour like so, and we're just going to take hot water, and we're going to make a dough very much like you'd make a dough out of a hard flour. That is to say, if you're familiar with the kinds of pasta that are, are available in Italy, in the north you have your soft wheat flour, the tagliatelle, the fettuccine, the pappardelle, lasagna, all that. In the south you have hard wheat flour, and they make what and that's called durum. So that's what makes spaghetti, penne, rigatoni, and all that stuff. This is different. This is a rye flour, and it's going to make a very delicious, firm dough. And all we have to do to make it is take some of that flour and add hot water to it. And very much like the old well method that we're familiar with, we're just going to stir it around until it all comes together like so. Better to have a slightly wet dough than too dry a dough. I always say. That's what you always say. Yeah. Slick gear pasta rules my world too. So, <laughs> so now we're going to bring it all together with our hands and just knead it just like it was a regular dough. Bringing it together quickly. 
then putting it out on your board. Mario, this is delicious. Is it delicious? Yeah. It's really and great. so easy to make, wouldn't you say, Mr. Sweaty? That was, that was very easy. Shouldn't be intimidating to anybody. Now, we're going to take the dough and just press it a little bit. Bring it all together very, very quickly. You don't oh, have wow. to really worry about kneading. It's just going to come up like so. And then we're going to make some gnocchi out of it. Now, of course, in the same way that we always make gnocchi, we're just going to form the ball, then dust our hands with a little bit of the old bench flour, and then roll it out into dowels. <clears throat> now, this is just like any other gnocchi we've ever made. Bring it like so, form the dowel dry, and then cut it into little pieces. Mario, is your gnocchi always de la nona? <clears throat> well, this one isn't. That's a no. very good thing, though. My gnocchi's all, well, there's three, but there's basically up until this point right now, there's always been three kinds of gnocchi that we've talked about on the show. There's the gnocchi of potatoes, there's the gnocchi made of semolina, the gnocchi romana, and then there's also the gnocchi of ricotta. And this, here we are, breaking new ground. We're making gnocchi from rye dough, which has nothing to do with the way my grandma ever made them. She never made it like this at all. What they are going to do is provide a very interesting flavor side when we're talking about how it's going to mix with this beautiful cuttlefish ragu. So in the same way that we've always made gnocchi, we flick them off the forks, putting the cut side of the small pieces of dough parallel to the tines of the fork, and giving it the old... What do we call this there, Mr. Swidey? It's called the old flickeroo. Don't talk with your mouth full, Mr. Swidey. We're working on manners today. Now, we'll flick them like so. <laughs> and there you have the gnocchi. Now, we'll continue like this to make all these, but what we're going to now make is a little bit of a cuttlefish ragu. Cuttlefish is kind of like a member of the calamari family, except it has, instead of a littler head and long tentacles, it has a big head and short tentacles. It's delicious, it's easy to find, it's not very expensive. It makes a great ragu. One of the things like calamari though is it either cooks for two minutes or it cooks for a full hour. And this is going to be the time where we cook it for a full hour. Mario, did you know that um, Hank's been known to cuddle fish himself? Has he? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not surprised because Hank is multifaceted in Sometimes my Sometimes they look at you, you know, and... Uh... So now to make the ragu, <laughs> to make the ragu, we're going to take some onions, a little bit of garlic. Can you use cuttlefish ink just like you would? You certainly can. It's exactly the same thing as squid ink in terms of flavoring pasta or risotto or polenta. Now we've got a really smoking hot pan here. We're going to add our onions. And we're going to toss them around for just a second. Then we're going to take our cuttlefish, which we've cleaned and cut into strips. Us? Well, no, you're, not, you're virtually unfrightenable. Stop. We're going to toss it through really, really quickly. Then we're going to add a little bit of olives. Guy ate the olives that have been pitted. We're going to add a little bit of salt to get everything to start giving it up. We're going to add about a cup of pureed fresh tomatoes that have then been cooked down for about a second. And we're going to stir the whole thing together. This will then come up to a boil, then we'll simmer it down, and I'll show you when we come back how we're going to bring the whole thing together to make gnocchi di sagale con ragù di sepia. So stay with us. Okay, now we've got our beautiful rye gnocchi. We are going to allow them to sit. You don't have to cook them immediately. They're much firmer than a potato gnocchi, so they're just going to be able to sit there like a lot of fresh pasta in Italy. We've got our ragu going over here of our cuttlefish. You want to cook it again that 40 minutes. It's starting to get quite soft. The uh, tomato sauce is reducing. What you want to do, keep an eye on it every now and then. If it looks like it's getting too ristretto or too tight, you just take a little bit of the pasta water and just keep it going there so it continues to cook. Now the next dish <clears throat> is another great one from Lupa and it's called calamari inzimino. Inzimino generally refers to any kind of a seafood stew that's finished with some kind of a pulse, that is to say one of these farinaceous products like these chickpeas and then a little bit of spinach or herbs. And in fact the way that we make it is very very simple. What we're going to do is take a little bit of onion, slice it paper thin because we want it to cook really really quickly because we're not going to cook it for very long. Then we're going to take our chickpeas. Now chickpeas, if you're not familiar with them, are also called chechi. And this is what they look like when they're dry. And the way we buy them is like this. We soak them overnight in cold water. We drain out the cold water. The next day we put them in a big pot covered by at least 100, 
twice as much water as there is chickpeas, and we bring it up to a boil. Then we lower the heat to a simmer, and we cook them until they're tender. The variation in age when you buy chickpeas can be immense. You can buy chickpeas that are two or three years old. You want to buy them from last year's harvest. Beans and pulses are generally harvested at the end of the summer, and then they're allowed to dry just a little bit in the sun, then they put them somewhere else to dry, and then they become dried beans. You could actually use these fresh right when they're harvested, but it's not very common. They're still delicious, just like this. You wouldn't want to crunch on one of these. Try one. <laughs> Can you speed up the process of... Uh, of soaking? Yeah, I mean, do you have to soak them overnight? Yeah, if you don't soak them overnight, you'll get this funny, weird, hard shell on the outside. Or you'll get some that have been cooked properly. So, sometimes people take them and just throw them right into hot water. What that tends to do is just mess up your whole bean situation. So what you definitely want to do is soak them. If you don't have the time, though, canned beans are one of the few products that I definitely dig. Canned products of the bean world are actually really good. They hold all of their fiber, all of their vitamins, and aside from a couple of brands that are just um, overcooked and smushy, almost across the board it's a great product. So they, they're easy, keep them in the house, they make great salads and all that kind of stuff. Enough about the beans. Now we're going to start with our Inzimino. We're going to take extra virgin olive oil, because we only cook with extra virgin olive oil at our house. Don't we slick? Always, always extra virgin. Extra virgin. Now we're going to take some onions and we're just going to lay them in the pan. Now we've cut them up into thin, thin slices. That means they're going to cook quickly. The more surface area they expose to the heat, the quicker they're going to cook, the more they're going to get caramelized. We're going to take a little bit of our chilies. I'm going to throw in a couple of the sneaky Darth Vader chilies as well as a little pinch because I like this to be spicy. Darth Vader. And then I'm going to take my chickpeas, my chechi, toss them in like so. Then we're going to take roasted tomatoes. <coughs> the chilies in the pan are going to give you the back of that throat scratch. Yes, did you have something to say? Can we add his hat to that. <laughs> no, get rid that, of it, please. That hat is not going in. We <laughs> may be able to use it as a serving utensil, but it's go. certainly not going to go in there. We don't want the fuzz to mix with our chechi. <laughs> now, what we do with tomatoes, then, when they're not in season, We'll take plum tomatoes just about year round, which aren't very good outside. Tomatoes are one of those vegetables that you should really eat out of your garden or in September, August, September, October. Outside of that, what we'll do is we'll take plum tomatoes from the southern part of America here, not South America. We'll cut them in half and we'll drizzle them with olive oil, put a little pinch of sugar and salt on them, and just roast them in the oven until they become soft. What that sugar and salt helps them do is kind of find their little tomato voice. And in fact, when they're like this, cooked like this, they're much better than when they are raw out of season. So what we're going to do is add a couple of those to the little stew here. One of the most important things is this liquid that goes in there. As the tomatoes cook, they release a little bit of their concentrated tomato flavor, and that is probably the best thing of the whole darn dish. A little drizzle of that. Then what we're going to do is we're going to toss that through and leave those tomatoes whole. We're going to take a few more olives, some gaeta olives, Toss them in like that, and pretty much at this point, we've created our sauce, or our, our real dish. Now, at this point, you could add anything. You could add just clams, you could add uh, calamari, for example, which is what we're going to do. But you could add any kind of a seafood here. Crab would be good in here, octopus, anything. It's all about the time of cooking. We're going to take our calamari here, that we've actually removed the heads from, and just toss it right in there like so. Now, this is going to be a relatively quick cook. This isn't going to be one of those... 40 minute cooks, it's going to be a two minute cook. So I'm going to toss this through like so. And at this point, we're going to add a few mussels, and they'll take literally about a minute and a half, two minutes to steam open. And there we have it. When we come back, I'm going to show you how we're going to finish that up. We're going to get our gnocchi in the water here, and we'll bring the whole Roman seafood display right to the table. So stay with us. Bring it. Welcome back. Now we've got our inzimino going there. What I'm going to add is a little bit of sopressata to give it that pure pork luxury flavor. We're going to take a few leaves of mint. The mussels have just started opening. We're going to put spinach right across the top here and season it lightly with a little you're, bit of salt. You're mad. You're I'm a mad. I've gone crazy. <laughs> then what we're going to do is take the top and just kind of steam the spinach down just a little bit. Oop, not without adding. A little bit of that sweet and sour component. We're going to add some currants here, or raisins, golden raisins. And now our gnocchi are ready. Now we're going to take them out like so. Toss them right in there like that. And they're starting to do the right thing. I can sense it. 
What you want to do at this point, just like we always do, is toss them through the sauce. Now remember, the whole game here is making sure the pasta is just properly dressed. It looks like it's almost just a little tight or a little dry. We're going to stir it through like that. How can you tell, Martin? Because you look across the base of the pan, and you can see that there's almost no liquid whatsoever. We want it to be just moist without being too much dressed. Think of it as being dressed like a salad. We're going to add a little bit of extra virgin olive oil here at the last second, a little bit of parsley. Stir that through really quickly. Amen. And get in my belly. <laughs> Go with it, fellas. In my belly. Here's a little bit of our gnocchi di segale. Now over here we have our inzimino, Serve it up, which, is, which is now just steamed. Take a look at this. Come on, guys. There's another thing left here. I know there's a little food on the table, but pay attention, will you, fellas? So now the, the spinach just lightly steams like so. We don't want to really cause too much more cooking there. The mussels have all steamed open, and this is a very touchy point on the dish. The mussels are open, the calamari is just cooked. At this point, you're making your decision. Am I going to serve it now, or am I going to serve it an hour? I know what you're thinking, I want that. He's got a gnocchi there. Is he ready to eat? We're going to go with it now. We're going to add a little bit more chilies, because I'm really into the spice. Again, with tomato, we always add just a little bit of extra virgin olive oil off the heat, and into the bowl. And there you have it, Seafood Fest a la Romana. I want to thank you guys for being here. Oh, you are so you. cool. I want to thank you guys for being here. You make the show a lot of fun. I look forward to seeing you all on the next Molto Mario. Thank Ciao. you, Mario.